Good morning. My name is Pastor Craig. I'm so glad you are here today. And uh, back about 10 years ago, it was Easter morning and uh, it was sunrise. And I had one of the most unique experiences. And it was sad, but it was also revealing. And what happened was Easter sunrise is I was in the room when my grandmother passed. And what was so unique about it is I walked up to her and I looked into her eyes and grandma was gone. Like the the spirit of grandma, the essence of who grandma is, her soul was clearly gone. It was like a car had been parked, keys were thrown in the driver's seat, and somebody walked away. And I just stood there marveling at how the grandma I knew was gone. Clearly, there was something about her that was missing, that the spirit of her was gone. And I've used that just in my mind to to really marvel at how complex we are, that the spirit within us, uh, it, some people say it this way, the, the, the view into people's hearts or the windows to their soul are through their eyes. This unique idea of we have something about us that's unique. And in our study today, we're going we're gonna to dive into something very, very precious. And I want to remind us of a couple things before we get into our message. We just came out of the study of Exodus, and that was a narrative. And so the way we study, the way we taught was very different uh, from First Peter, which was an epistle. And so as we look at those different ways of looking at Scripture, today we're going to study and get into a book study of the entirety of Scripture. We're going to be jumping throughout the text because the topic of the day is the Holy Spirit, and it will require us to have a fullness of the Scripture. And so when you see this title, hello, my name is the Holy Spirit, how did you respond? What was your first instinct? I I bet some of you are super excited because you have a healthy theology of who the Holy Spirit is. In fact, you might be excited to learn a little bit more or to to figure out how the Holy Spirit is a part of your life and how you can uh, work with the Holy Spirit. And it's exciting to know that many of you have that theology, but I'll bet there's some of you As soon as you heard we're studying the Holy Spirit, you kind of got scared. There was fear in you. Fear like this. What happens if the Holy Spirit truly speaks to me and tells me to go somewhere I don't want to go? What happens if the Holy Spirit reveals things in me that I don't like, that I know are already true, but, but now I have to deal with it? So some of you might have some fear around the Holy Spirit. Others may just think, uh, that's just like just a presence. It's not really anything except, I guess, God's Spirit. It's this present thing that I don't know how to deal with or if I've really experienced or how to interact with. And then, of course, there are some of you who have experienced the Holy Spirit in powerful ways, but there's others who observed that and questioned in a way that it maybe seemed weird to you. It just seemed weird what was happening. And so I want to lay a foundation today, first of all, that we want to enter into a six-week study that I believe if you'll take the time to do some study, take some, take some time to, to press in and really understand that you'll be blessed and you'll begin to experience the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. And, and we came across, Jason sent us this, this statistic, and I want to read this to you. This statistic says that nearly 60% of Americans who regularly attend a Christian church say there is no such thing as the Holy Spirit. They say the Holy Spirit is just a symbol of God's power or presence or purity. Where do you land? When I mention the the topic of the Holy Spirit, where do you land? Do you believe? Do you doubt? Are you confused? Do you wonder? Or are you part of the 60% as this uh, statistic says that the Holy Spirit really isn't a real thing? Where do you land? And my hope is that you will open your eyes to who the Holy Spirit is. Because if you begin to see the truth of Scripture, I believe you will begin to see the truth of the Holy Spirit. And so I want to begin with just a little bit of theology. We need to to get a bigger picture of the study we're diving into. So I'm going to take you to Genesis 1. So if you want to open your Bibles, uh, first page of the Bible, basically, once you get to the preface and all the, the dates and stuff, get to the first book of the Bible, first page, and it begins this way. In the beginning, God, and I need you to pause right there. In the beginning, 
God. See, in our word for God in English, we lose kind of the fullness of what that means. Uh, the Hebrew word is Elohim, and this is a plural noun, meaning a noun, a thing, God, but there's this multifaceted element of God, this plurality to God. Now, let's make it real clear. We believe there is one God, and if you missed the whole Exodus series, you better go back. I would encourage you, go back. Go watch the series. Study up on it, because we just spent an entire summer looking at the one true God, the I am, the all-powerful, omniscient, omnipresent, super compassionate, incredible, loving God who is sovereign over all things. So we can't lose all that teaching when we step into this teaching about the Holy Spirit. So one, we start the fourth word of the entire Bible, God. And I know many people wrestle just with that concept. What do you mean God? Is there a God? Who is God? What is God? You you wrestle with these questions. But we have to begin there. In the beginning, God, this plural nature, this plurality. And as we read further, it says this, that God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Right off the bat, you're going, that's not the Holy Spirit, perhaps. No, what I want to tell you is the Spirit of God is the Holy Spirit. And I want you to see in this picture, we begin with God, who we'll refer to as God the Father. And now we have the Spirit of God or the Holy Spirit. And let me just just give you a couple of ideas here. As you read through the fullness of Scripture, you're going to see the Holy Spirit, the verbiage about the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, in a lot of ways. You're going to see it as the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, Spirit of truth, the Spirit of grace, the Spirit of glory, the Spirit of life, the Spirit of wisdom and revelation in the symbol of a dove, a seal of water, of oil, of wind, of breath, of fire. The fullness of the Holy Spirit comes in so many beautiful pictures, and we can't take those as individual separate. We must put them all together into the Holy Spirit. And so in Genesis, we see God creating and the Holy Spirit was part of that, the Spirit of God. And I want to take you one more place. That's an Old Testament book. If you want to jump into the book of John, John 1, I want to introduce you to Jesus into the fullness of God. Look what it says in John 1, in the beginning was the Word. And we did a study on the Word. The Word is Jesus. So let's just, for our purpose now, let's make Jesus the focus. In the beginning was Jesus. He is the Word. And the Word was with God. Jesus was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, Jesus. And in Genesis and in John, we bring those together and we see God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in this unique way that is so complex. And so I want to start with a question and help you wrestle with this. How much mystery can your faith handle? Because for some of you, I bet you there's already smoke boiling out of your ears. How do I deal with this? See, there's this word we use, Trinity. This is not a word you'll find in the Bible. This is a word uh, developed by man to try to understand a complex and beautiful, majestic, powerful, complex God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, one true God. This picture does justice as best as you can. If you look at it, you see the Father in the corner there. The Father is not the Son, but the Father is God. And likewise, the Son is not the Father, and the Son is not the Holy Spirit, but the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father, and the Holy Spirit is not the Son, and, but the Holy Spirit is God. But altogether, what I want you to hold closely is that the mystery of God is beyond our understanding. And if you feel you have to understand God to follow him, then you are up for a long journey because the reality is he cannot be understood. His ways are above our ways. It says, Scripture says, his thoughts are above our thoughts. And I'm so grateful that our God is mysterious because if I could understand God, why would I need him first of all? Because the Scripture would be like this Genesis moment where the this, this serpent says, you could be like God. Well, I'm going to tell you, there's only one God, and I'm going to affirm that I am not him and neither are you. There is one God. 
And it's important that we have this, uh, th- this, in, this incredibly difficult concept because it doesn't work out mathematically. Heather, part of our teaching team, said it this way. God's math doesn't make sense. One plus one plus one in our minds equals three. And he says, not in my math, not in my world, not for who I am. See, one plus one plus one equals one. And he, he states this in a way of relating to marriage, that when a man and a woman get married, he says, the two become one. One plus one is one. And so God's math is hard to understand. He's complex. And we want to take this premise and move forward in our message today. This supernatural God, this unattainable to understand the fullness, this holy, perfect God. And I want to give you this statement. The Holy Spirit is God. I've said a lot. I want to rest for a moment. The Holy Spirit is God. I encourage you to say that for a moment. The Holy Spirit is God. Let that rest in your soul for a moment. See, as we look from Genesis to Revelation in the fullness of the book, the Old Testament refers to the Holy Spirit, uh, depending on how you do your search, but a minimum of 335 times just in the Old Testament. And then God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, another 431 times. All of them pointing back to the truth. The Holy Spirit is God. I want to take you to one passage. Just the danger of one passage. We should never build a theology out of one passage. But when we look at the Holy Spirit, what we're going to find throughout our teaching is that the passage we share is supported throughout Scripture. So let's take you to a passage. I'd like you to look at 1 Corinthians 3.16. 1 Corinthians 3.16. It says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? So first of all, when you come to faith, saving faith in Jesus Christ, when you place your faith in Him as the Redeemer, as the Savior, it says that you then, the Scriptures teach, are the dwelling place. God moves in to you. You become the temple of the living God. And it says here that God's Spirit dwells in you. God's Spirit. There's two words that if you go back to the Greek, we have pneuma, that's for Holy or for spirit, and that that means the very spirit and soul of God, the spirit, pneuma. It's a noun, it's a thing. And then, of course, theo, God, God, the deity of God. And both combined together are this universal nouns, these this complexity of God's spirit is in essence God. His spirit is God. And it says that because his spirit is God, his spirit dwells in you. Therefore, God dwells in you in the form of his spirit. And it makes me just marvel when I read scripture. I was really struck by this looking at some commentaries. I had never seen it this way, but if you go to Isaiah or you go to Revelation, there's, there's a couple references there in Isaiah and in Revelation where these creatures and, and angels are worshiping the Lord. And they repeat this phrase, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy. And it doesn't explicitly teach this, but it makes me think that perhaps Holy Father, Holy Son, and Holy Spirit, the Lord God Almighty, this picture of three in one, this incredible trinity, so complex though. I want to continue our study today. I want us to to take that idea that the Holy Spirit is God, but to help kind of unpack this together, I want to bring somebody special on stage. So I want to invite up Heather Jones. Heather Jones is not only our life groups director, but she is part of our teaching team. And you'll often hear her quoted as we talk and as we teach. Come on up, Heather. And uh, I want to introduce Heather to you because she has an incredible story, but she also has an incredible view that God continues to unpack in her mind as we look at Scripture together. So welcome, Heather. So glad you could make it. I want you to go ahead and start, and I'll just let you kind of speak for a few moments. Tell a little bit of your story, because where you come from, your past, has a profound impact on why you're here today. So it's very true. It's all yours. Thank you. Um, I'm so glad to be here. My name is Heather Jones. I'm the Life Groups Director here at Family Church. I've been at Family Church on staff for 10, going on 11 years, Um, and I've been in Life Groups for almost that long. 
and uh, now I'm teaching Life on Purpose, and uh, I'm really excited to be able to be up here and share with you. I think one of the really cool things we get to do on Wednesday is get really nerdy about God's Word and and prepare these messages, and I'm I'm excited to kind of get to share that with with all of you. Um, but for me personally, I didn't grow up in the church, uh, at least not in a good Christian church, a good solid Christian foundation. I actually grew up, my mom is Chilean, um, and I was raised predominantly with my mom's family. So I, we grew up kind of nominally Catholic. And then my mom got married when I was four, and we became really good uh, Jack Mormons, which is just a super affectionate term used by Mormons to describe people who are just nominally involved. We went when, uh, you know, they built the new temple in Portland. We would go to funerals, the occasional Sunday uh, um, church meeting. But beyond that, we weren't super involved until about middle school. We got very, very devout. A lot of that was at my own insistence. My best friend was Mormon. Um, I really loved like the, the family feel of Mormonism. And I hadn't really grown up in the church, so I didn't have a lot to compare it to. It felt different than Catholicism. But um, for the most part, it was it was just getting involved there. And I, I asked a lot of questions. I ended up getting baptized. And as Craig and I were kind of talking about my story, I was thinking through this and I was like, it was very transactional. Honestly, the making a decision um, to get baptized was uh, more about becoming a member of the Mormon church. And, and, um, and you know, doing the, the the class that they had me do, it was about whether or not I was ready for membership and being sealed by the Holy Spirit was more, and this is a them thing. I don't know. I, I really, there's not a whole lot of legitimacy that I find in this anymore, but for sure at the time, I thought this was very holy. This was a, this was a, this was the act I needed to do in order to be a good person, uh, was be a good Mormon. And none of it ever was really like be a good Jesus follower or be a good Christian, but it was be a good Mormon. And I was a really good Mormon for a little while until I wasn't, uh, cause I'm all in or I'm all out. And, uh, at that point I was all out. Um, I met Kurt, we had two kids, we got married and, um, I'm, I have these two kids and I'm thinking, I don't want to raise heathens. So, um, we should go back to church. We should, we should go to the Mormon church. And I started to try to take us and Kurt kind of went. And meanwhile, he's meeting with this guy named Tim, who is a wholesaler on the car lot that Kurt worked at. And he's telling Tim a little bit about going to the Mormon church. And Tim's like, it's not a good idea. And so Tim started to fill Kurt's mouth with all these stories about uh, all this information about how the Mormon church wasn't, wasn't grounded in the gospel. And so Kurt would come home and he would bring all of Tim's arguments and we would argue about whether or not being Mormon was a good thing. And uh, we agreed to disagree. But Kurt continued to hang out with Tim, continued to be discipled by Tim. Tim was living blessed long before I knew blessed was a thing. And, and he really brought Kurt to church with him. And one day Kurt comes home and he's so excited because he, he tells me, I accepted Jesus today. I gave my heart to Jesus. And I just looked at him like, good for you, you know? But he could have told me he was selling Amway for all I knew. I had zero understanding of what it meant to like give your heart to Jesus. Um, and yet I began to see these really big changes in Kurt. Having babies didn't make Kurt suddenly more conscious of people and love them better and, and be a better person. Being married didn't make him do that. Suddenly, though, this giving his heart to Jesus thing made him want to be a better husband, want to be a better father, want to be a better person. And, and he started kind of living for something so much bigger than himself. And I just thought there's got to be something to this give your heart to Jesus thing that I don't really understand. So I started to kind of check it out and it freaked me out at first. Uh, I went on to a church. They had a band on the stage and I was like, this cannot be right. <laughs> this cannot be good. Um, and yet uh, I, I continued to keep coming and Tim really challenged me with the verse in, in John 14, 6, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And, and I know now that the Holy Spirit just let that dig right into my brain. And I could not figure out how I had, how I had missed it. Like, it, this wasn't about Joseph Smith, and this wasn't about the Book of Mormon, and it wasn't about being a good Mormon or going to a Mormon church, but this, everything hinged on whether or not I, I believed in Jesus. And so um, at that point is when I gave my life to, 
to um, Jesus also. So it's weird though now to to look at it and see how much the Holy Spirit was in in my story. And as we kind of prepared for this message, we were talking through this series and, and really digging into scripture. But you said something when we first sat down. I wanted to quote it, but you're here. So I thought this was profound when you thought about the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. So would you kind of just pack it, unpack that for a moment? Yeah, we were thinking through what we were going to do with life groups for the fall. And um, I, I really wanted to go in one direction uh, of really helping the church unpack how we should behave with one another. And it just felt so much like, I'm just asking you to bootstrap up and be a better Christian. And at the end of the day, what we really, what I really want is for us to know the Holy Spirit who does this work in us. And as I started to think through my own relationship, as I started to ask others about their relationship with God, I mean, that statistic was something else the first time reading that. Um, I, I started to kind of feel through my relationship with God and my relationship with the Father, though I know I cannot fully grasp him or hold him is profound and rich and deep and and it's so loving and he's so gracious and kind and um you know a lot of people say that you put your earthly father on God and in for me, it was not that at all. Like God was everything. My earthly father was not. He was present. He knows me so intimately. Like the number of hairs on my head knows me. And and he sent his perfect son to die for me. And and I wouldn't. I mean, it was it was not. I don't I don't know how that could possibly have been worth it. But he he pursues me and and he's kind to me and he's gentle to me and he gives me good gifts and he has a purpose and a plan for me. And my relationship with the father is beautiful. My relationship with the son who then, who also went and died for me, like that idea that he, he came and, and suffered so terribly so that I could be in relationship with him is beyond me. And then not only that, but he's the perfect man. Like, The Bible says he wasn't a whole lot to look at, but he drew a crowd. Um, He loved people well. He was passionate about both the mission and the people. Uh, A lot of us don't handle both of those things well, but Jesus really did a great job. and, And he's theologically sound and he's challenging and he's just all of the things that you really want to admire in a person exist in Christ. And then I look at the Holy Spirit and I was like, I mean, I kind of know that guy. You know, I just didn't feel as connected to, to that part of the Trinity. And, and uh, we've talked about it a couple of times on the team, but like, that would be like me saying, there's a third of my husband that I'm just kind of freaked out about. I don't really know. I don't understand. It, it just, it, I mean, I know it's there, but I don't really know what to do with it. It wouldn't be okay for us to just leave off a part of our spouses. And yet I feel like to some degree, we're kind of comfortable doing that with a whole entire part of God. Yeah, that's an interesting thought because we uh, we do. We acknowledge the Father. We experience the Son, the love of the Son, and, and see it in Scripture, and, and then just our hearts are drawn. And then, yeah, here's the Spirit. Now, what do I do with this? How, how do I experience this? Um, and so last thing I want you to share is real quick is as you came to faith, as, as the Scriptures were revealed by the Spirit to you, when you started looking, though, what did you say about the Spirit? Yeah, um, Kurt and I got each other Bibles for our anniversary, and I, I got us highlighters. And um, what I started to notice as I was going through just normal things, going through Exodus, going through, currently I'm, I'm in my own personal study in Romans. The more you look for the Holy Spirit, the more you will find him. I highlight, I have a Holy Spirit highlighter. Every time I find him in there, I start highlighting him. I just think the more you begin to look for him, the more you find him. Yeah, and the more you find him, the more you'll experience him. And so really our hope in this study is really to unpack what we cannot do justice in a 30-minute message. There's no way. And so we're going to ask you to to go through, maybe get yourself a Holy Spirit Hiler and begin to look through, where are you? Where are you, God, in the Scriptures as the Holy Spirit? Um, One of the things, too, I know there's no way we can look at the fullness of all the possibilities in this one message. Um, In fact, one of the things that was interesting in the Old Testament, that the, the Holy Spirit was given to very few people or select for very specific times 
for the movement of God. And yet you and I, if we are in Christ, it says that we receive the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to unpack that through the course of this series. What does that really mean? But we want to just take you to a couple of scriptures to look at the fullness. Remember the premise today that the Holy Spirit is God. But let's look at the fullness of God in three examples, and then we'll unpack a fourth one with a little more depth. So if you want to open your Bibles or just follow along, we'll put it on the screen. Uh, Matthew 28. This is as a guy who's constantly involved with the global mission. This verse comes up a lot, but really it's the mission we've been placed on. And this is Jesus, of course, commanding and giving the command to you and I, to the disciples, specifically in this passage. But he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. And here we're just looking at a few examples of where the fullness of God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are all put together in one passage. Just to, there's lots of them. These are just a few to look at. So yeah, I was I was really astounded at the number of times we saw all three of them all together um, as we were doing some of the research for this study. I. I, I'm I'm serious. We don't miss him because he's not there. We miss him because we're not looking. But once you start to look, you will see him everywhere. So the one that, that I loved too was in Acts uh, 1, 4 through 5. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem. This is talking about Jesus, but to wait for the promise of the Father. He's talking about the Holy Spirit, which he said, you heard from me, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. I love it so much because Jesus is like, don't go, wait. Something really good is coming. That thing, that, that, that gift that God promised you, the Father promised you, is coming to you. So don't leave until you get this. That's how important it was. He didn't want them to go on to the next thing without having this with them. Yeah, and this, this beautiful picture of this baptism, it's, you're going to be immersed. You're going to be indwelled with the Spirit. What a cool opportunity for us to experience. And then one more just to look at as it comes out of Luke. And many of you are familiar perhaps with this passage, Luke chapter 3, 21 and 22. This is the picture of Jesus getting baptized as he's sent into ministry. It says, now all the people were baptized. And when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. And just the picture, the Father looking down on the Son, the fullness of God represented in the, the dove, the, the Spirit in a bodily form of a dove in this example, looking on the Son. And I know that from the Mormon faith, they actually like to take this and use this as a reason why the, this is not the fullness of God, that Jesus is not God. And yet, as you look through Scripture, you see over and over again the fullness of the Trinity, the fullness of God. But we want to get into John. So if you want to open to the book of John, this is really where we want to camp out for the remainder of our time. John chapter 14. Remember I said, there's no way it would be wise of us to take one scripture and build a theology out of that. We need the fullness of God's word. And so in this weekend's message, we can't take the fullness from Revelation to Genesis cover to cover. We couldn't possibly do that. But I think what we see in this, in this chapter, in John chapter 14, is really the essence of what we're talking about. And uh, it is affirmed throughout the scriptures. So let's, let's take a look. John chapter 14, verse 25 and 26, it says this, and this is again, Jesus is speaking and he says, these things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. We have four things we'd really like to just pull out of this text. Encourage you to write your notes, fill in those blanks, and then take this and stew on this information today. Let the Spirit work on your heart so that you come to a greater clarity. But the first point we want to make is this. Jesus acknowledges the Spirit. He says, these things I have, I have spoken to you. That's Jesus talking. And he's, and he's saying that the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father is going to send, he's going to teach you all the things. Jesus gives credence to who the Holy Spirit is. If you're wondering whether or not you can trust who the Spirit is, you're wondering whether or not you can trust the work of the Spirit in your life, you're wondering whether or not you want that in you, Jesus says, yes. 
Jesus said, absolutely, this is the guy. Trust him. I'm sending him to you. He's good. Yeah. Yeah, we see this a lot too in scripture. Um, there's this incredible story of this guy named Saul. Now, now Saul, we know him perhaps as the apostle Paul, but Saul was the persecutor of Christians. Saul comes to an incredible moment of salvation as he's confronted by Jesus. And then his name is changed, his purpose is changed, but he is not exactly trusted. And so he gets this guy named Barnabas and Barnabas has to hang out with him and vouch for him or acknowledge that this guy, Paul, he is not who he was, he is new. And so when the spirit is spoken of, Jesus affirms it. And it reminded me of your story though. You said, Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. Do we trust Jesus? Then why wouldn't we trust him as he acknowledged the Spirit? What a, what a cool, powerful thing there. Um, second thing we want to point out today is the Holy Spirit has a purpose. Take a look at the text there. The Holy Spirit has a purpose. Let's just read it again. It says, these things I've spoken to you while I'm still with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring a remembrance of all that I've said. The Holy Spirit has a purpose. In this passage, it is that he will teach you what I've said Jesus is teaching. He will help you remember all the things I've taught you. And we're going to look through the scripture over the course of the, the next several weeks that the indwelling is how this happens, that the, the Spirit indwells you. We'll, we'll unpack that more later. That he seals us. That's one of his purposes. That he bears fruit in us. That's a purpose. And he points to the Father and the Son. This is one of the things that is so unique about the Holy Spirit. The Spirit's purpose is to draw your attention and your worship to the Son, and to the Father. And you're going to find that he's never going to say, look at me, look at me. His job is to teach you, to guide you. He has a purpose, and it is profound. He has a purpose. The next big thing we really want you to see is that the Holy Spirit is a person. It's not an it. It's not an impersonal force. I, I grew up kind of believing it was an impersonal force. It sounds like a number of attending believers, uh, 60%, think that maybe the Holy Spirit might be an impersonal force. It is not. Uh, we see here in Scripture in verse 26, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you. Um, that, that's a pronoun. And it also just says, hey, that's a person. It literally means that person. The person of the Holy Spirit will teach you all the things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Um, the Holy Spirit has emotions even. It can be grieved. We, we, it's sensitive to the, the things that we, we bring it to. So I think it, we have to stop looking at the Holy Spirit. I even have to stop looking. I want to call it it all the time. We have to stop looking at the Holy Spirit like he's not a person. He is a person and, and we need to treat him as such. Yeah. And you're going to see throughout your study as you, if you take this on and begin to look, you're going to see the Holy, Holy Spirit refer to himself as I or myself. I am sending you. I have chosen. Uh, I'm the one in charge myself. He, he has these uh, me, he'll say me. These are the, the statements of the personhood of the Holy Spirit, but don't neglect the godliness of, the, the deity of the Holy Spirit in full cooperation with the Father and the Son, not a separate God. This is where people begin to get a little confused. One true God, that is it. Keep that and hold that so close. Um, the last one we wanna kind of unpack and just finish here for, for today is this, that the Father and the Son send the Spirit. Just coming back to the fullness of the Trinity. Look what it says again, verse 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all these things. See, the, the Father and the Son are a huge part of affirming the Holy Spirit, sending the Holy Spirit, and reminding us of the power and the purpose of the Holy Spirit. And so as we, as we walk through this, I want you to be aware of something. This, this is not an it. This isn't a random force. This isn't just some kind of symbolic power of God. This is the person of God who dwells in you and gives you uh, not only the remembrance of who God the Father is and how to pray and how to worship the Son, but it draws you into a deeper relationship and direct communion with the Father. And so tell me a little bit about Life Groups and why we're doing this study as we close here. Yeah, Life Groups will be spending 
at least the first eight weeks studying about the Holy Spirit, some of you guys six weeks, some of you eight weeks, ideally you will spend the year really looking at the Holy Spirit, getting to know him better, um, and, and, and living in a deeper, more beautiful, complex relationship with the Holy Spirit. Um, and, and I really want to encourage you to get into a life group. Join a life group. Get to know the Holy Spirit with a group of people who are also getting to know the Holy Spirit. You don't have to do this alone. Um, get that Holy Spirit highlighter and, and really just join in with a community who want to grow closer to God, to know him more, and to allow him to use them more freely. Cool. And then get ready. Grab your Bibles, get into the Word, begin to study on your own in groups, have conversations. We want to encourage you not to take this message and then leave with this. Gee, I wish they would have said that. I wish they would have covered this. Uh, that's what we're going to try to do in six weeks, which quite honestly is a lifetime of learning. It's a lifetime of unpacking and exploring. So we hope that you will dive in and begin to experience the truth about the Holy Spirit. Uh, we love you guys, and I'm going to release to the campuses this time. Well, you stuck around if you're online, and I want to send you off with one incredible opportunity. We've been talking about the bless rhythm, and the bless rhythm is unpacking what Tim's story was in Heather's story, that Tim apparently was living out this natural outflow of praying daily, interceding with the Spirit, and then going out and being sent, and then having conversation with people like Kurt. And uh, so we want to encourage you to begin in prayer. Beginning in prayer is very simple. Open your mind in the morning to what God would have for you. It's a simple prayer, I believe, to say, God, would you use me today? Would you show me where you're calling me? Would you open up my ears and my eyes to those who are ready to have a conversation about you? And then would you give me the words to say when that opportunity arises? You may not have a, an opportunity every day, but wouldn't it be great if each day we were preparing our hearts for that? And then as you leave the house, as you get in your car, as you walk, as you enter work, continue to bring that remembrance to begin in prayer in all your conversations. And then remember, as you talk to people, listen to what they're saying. You don't need to come in with an answer if you don't even know what they're asking. So listen, ask the Spirit to give you ears to hear. Invite them into relationships, eat with people, and enjoy that fellowship. Serve people and allow them to serve you. And ultimately, when the time is right, share your testimony, share the gospel in the power of the Spirit and see what God would do through you. We love you guys. Have a great day. And may God bless you as you pursue Him in the blessed rhythms of your life.